Today is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I should tell you right away that I am fighting a cold or have a cold. That's why I haven't been shaking hands or hugging this morning. I assume you don't want my disease, so uh, if it seems like I was being less affectionate, that's why. Uh, also, uh, your pastor is now a criminal. I uh, was uh, uh, had a conversation with a Gilbert policeman this morning. Uh, by the way, that 25 mile an hour speed limit through town is real, uh, and uh, you should probably follow it, <laughs> unless you would like to have a conversation with one of our fine law enforcement officers. Uh, so, and uh, I'm loaded up on all these over-the-counter cold meds. Uh, so that plus it being an hour earlier than it's supposed to be, uh, I'm probably more fuzzy-headed than usual, so I'll apologize in advance for that. If you would, please uh, stand if you choose to do so and join me in our call to worship. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. And if you would join me in our prayer of invocation. Almighty God, your son fasted 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are, but did not sin. Give us grace to direct our lives in obedience to your spirit, that as you know our weakness so we may know your power to save through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 379, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Number 379. <laughs> choose. Although God has given the church the message of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ, 
We fall short of God's call to be salt of the earth and light of the world. Let us confess our misdeeds first with our corporate prayer in the bulletin and then our personal and silent prayers of confession. If you will join me. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have turned them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Let all God's children say, Amen. By Christ's work, we are reconciled and united with God and with one another. Thanks be to God for the good news. And now that we are forgiven in Christ, let us forgive one another. Peace be unto you. Let us confirm what we believe now with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I will uh, uh, quickly go through uh, some of the announcements. Uh, the first one, as always, is the storehouse food pantry. Always looking for non-perishable food items. Feeding the hungry is a primary mission for the Presbyterian Church, this Presbyterian Church in particular, but also in our area because there are so many who are hungry. Specifically, they're looking for canned soups and uh, spaghetti and meatballs or ravioli or any of that Chef Boyardee type stuff. Uh, but any uh, non-perishable food item is welcome. Uh, there's a couple of examples as a reminder right there on the pulpit. Uh, prayer shawls are still available anytime you would need one for anyone who needs uh, some comfort and some healing power. Uh, Presbyterian women will meet Wednesday. That's this Wednesday at 530 in the fellowship hall. A devotion and lesson will be led by Tina Klein. Jessica Halk will be the hostess. And so we'll see you at 530 on Wednesday. Also on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, Bell Choir practice at 7 o'clock. On Thursday, Narcotics Anonymous will meet here at 7.30 p.m. Uh, one thing I will remind you of as we're getting closer to it, on March 31st, there will not be a worship service here in our church. We're doing our cluster gathering for Fifth Sunday on March 31st, and this time it's at First Presby in Logan. And uh, we hope to see you all there. Did I miss anything or anybody have any other announcement they would like to make? 
Let's uh, talk about joys then. My favorite part. It didn't rain yet today. That's a joy. I don't know when we became Seattle, but uh, uh, I uh, talked to a meteorologist named Spencer Adkins who tells me uh, that the average rainfall for this area is 35 to 40 inches a year. Uh, in the last 18 months, we've had 80 inches of rain. So um, uh, I, I, I'm hoping that weather pattern will shift back to normal so I don't have to live in a swamp. Uh, any other joys? I have my granddaughter Kyla and her friend Aubrey with us. Welcome. Good morning. A wonderful music conference this week. Wonderful music conference this week in Charleston, was it? Making a joyful noise. Certainly enjoy with everything going on there. And two musicians. A big joy. More joyful noise. How about concerns? Dave and Pat Austin. Jerome Trent had a, had a PET scan last week and did not get very good news um, from his doctor. So continue prayers for Jerome. I can tell you my mother had her spinal injection and has been, uh, as always, in extreme pain after that. Uh, but it, So I guess it's more of a joy. It has started to subside. And uh, in a couple of days, she'll be a whole new person because she won't be in constant agonizing pain in her back. Uh, it, it gets rid of about 80% of the pain. So that's really more of a joy, but uh, it's been uh, a rough few days. Linda May um, had some sort of a procedure on her heart last week. Any other concerns? I have one of those as well. Let's pray for the intercession of Christ. Compassionate God, your son gives rest to those who are weary with heavy burdens. Heal the sick in body, heal the sick in mind, and the sick in spirit. Lift up the depressed. Befriend those who grieve. Comfort the anxious. Stand with all victims of abuse and crime. Awaken those who damage themselves and others. Fill all people with your Holy Spirit, that they may bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. And now, uh, how about uh, some young disciples? You wanna, would you guys like to come up or would you rather uh, wait and uh, maybe do it next time? We're talking about the Beatitudes this morning. See, and I'm going to bribe you for your uh, love by uh, getting into the magic bag and picking up whatever suckers you might like, and as many as you would like. Sorry, but uh, a sugar rush is coming, and, and since I don't have to deal with it, I'm fine with it. Uh, you guys ever heard of the Beatitudes? Uh, there are a bunch of verses that Jesus did during the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I'm sure you've heard, blessed are the poor, for they will be uh, fulfilled, right? That kind of thing. Well, that's what we've been talking about in our Young Disciples uh, sermon uh, the past few weeks. We're going to continue to do that. Today is, blessed are the meek, so they shall inherit the earth. Now, do you know what meek means? And, it's, uh, and uh, if, even if you had heard of it, you might have a different definition than what happens in the Bible. Meek means mild. Uh, to us in our culture, we define it as someone who is quiet, kind of demure, maybe even a little bit socially anxious, very quiet, very calm. That's one definition of meek. What they're talking about in the Bible, though, when Jesus says, blessed are the meek, 
He's talking about people who are willing to listen to others and have their mind changed about something or who are willing to learn about other people. Uh, a lot of times there's differences between people. And that ends up being a whole lot of people not liking each other because they're different or they have different ideas. A meek person is willing to listen to other people and learn about them and then still love them. And so they get to inherit the earth. Anyone who is willing to take in somebody who's different from them, take them into their heart and to love them and to know them and learn about them, that is a meek person. You're teachable is another way to put it. And that is why you will inherit the earth. Uh, when the new heaven and the new earth is here, the meek will inherit the earth. So shall we pray briefly? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your Beatitudes. These life lessons that you give us so we know who we are, who others are, and how to love ourselves and others. Make us meek and teachable. Amen. Thank you all very much. Welcome. Oh, you know what? I'm going to put you all to work. Come back up. It's time to do our mission offering. Uh, these funds go, well, uh, a lot of it stays right here uh, in West Virginia for uh, many projects, whether it be building a bridge or feeding the hungry, but it also a portion of it goes all over the world uh, as we do God's work. So I'm going to ask our young disciples uh, to uh, go around and, and collect. Uh, we thank you very much for, uh, just remember this, even a dollar makes a difference. Thank you very much. See, so didn't think you were going to get put to work this morning. Father, we as a church and as individuals ask for your blessing upon these funds, on this treasure, so that it may go around the world and also stay here at home to do the work of mission, to help those in need. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 80, Jesus Walked This Lonesome Valley. Number 80.
Let us pray for illumination. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I can give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw down yourself from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a single stone. Jesus answered him, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh boy, this is a tough one, ain't it? I mean, here we are with Jesus face to face with the devil, and anything to do with Satan is always a tough one. Uh, also, we wonder why Jesus went out into the desert alone or the wilderness alone for 40 days and fasted that whole time. What was the purpose? Why did he do it? Why does he do it right after his baptism and uh, right after the Father proclaims him to the world as the Son? And the reaction to all of this, here's what we tend to do. With stories like this. This is what we do specifically here. We turn it into a football game. That's pretty much what we do. We think of it as this back and forth. Score after score battle. Between Christ and Satan. With Jesus of course winning at the end. And we all cheer in victory. Seriously. That is what we do. I mean think about it. Think about it. Every time you've been to a community play. Or a school play. That has this scene in it. At the end, the person that they have playing Jesus shouts the famous line, Get thee behind me, Satan! And the person they have playing the devil sort of slinks off, and the crowd cheers every time, just like a football game. Now, there's probably nothing inherently wrong with all of that, but the problem with it is that it misses the point entirely. It's not a football game or a competition. We begin missing the point of all of this in how we think about Satan. We think of the devil as some form of physical manifestation. We make him out to be a horror movie monster with bat wings or red skin and a tail that's bifurcated with a pitchfork or it's a man in dark robes with red glowing eyes. Some physical monster is what we think of when we think of the devil. And just look at the artwork in the, the bulletin we have right there. Everybody have a look at that. It's a perfect example of what we think of when we think of Satan. There are problems with this perception, though, of who and what Satan is. First, it leads us to perceive that somehow Satan is somehow equal to Jesus or even equal to God, as if the devil is somehow God's counterpart. God is good, the devil is bad, and there's this equality there uh, and a cosmic battle that goes on for all times between equal and opposing forces of good and evil. So let's be clear on this. Satan is real and can take and does take physical manifestation form sometimes. Satan is an intelligent and organized force of evil. It isn't random. Satan is a supernatural power, much more powerful than we are. However, Satan is not even close, not even close to the power of God. Not even close. God's power as the creator and ruler of all things is so immense, so complete, that nothing, including a supernatural devil, can even compare. 
the power of God is so much greater that it is impossible to even compare the two. You can't even use a metaphor like Satan's power is a drop of water and God's power is the ocean. That doesn't apply because God's power would be infinite oceans. They can't be compared. There's another problem with thinking about the devil in this physically manifested bat-winged monster. The supernatural force of evil we call Satan is far, far worse and much, much more dangerous than a horror movie monster. For today's scripture, the simplistic view of the devil, this bat-winged monster, a very simplistic view of evil, doesn't answer any of the questions we have about this scripture or any of the questions we have about the nature of evil. Evil is much more complex. Much more complex. Now as we unpack today's test and text, we will see the complexity of evil. It isn't this simple monster. It's much worse, much more dangerous. And we'll get answers for our questions too as we unpack this, test, this text. Abandon the physical form of evil in your mind entirely for just a moment. At least for the rest of our day today. Get rid of that idea of who Satan is. It is possible and maybe even likely that Satan, as he attempts to get Jesus to disobey God here, was not in a physical form. That he wasn't physically there. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been necessary. It isn't a physical attack that he's doing. It's an emotional and psychological attack that he's doing on Jesus. This is what I mean about the complexity of evil. It isn't just one thing or that simplistic view of evil. There is supernatural evil. There is the sin or evil of the world. There is the sin and evil inside us, each as individuals. And evil, the supernatural evil, will combine all those things together to come at you. That's the complexity of evil. It is complex. It's far more dangerous than any monster could be. Here's a real world, real world example of the complexity of this evil. We are advised in several places in the Bible not to let the sun go down on anger. And we've all heard the old axiom, don't go to bed angry. That generally pertains to marriage, and I'm not sure how you can be married and not go to bed angry. But... Uh, <coughs> I'm kidding. But uh, we're advised not to let the sun go down on our anger. If you allow a grudge to take hold, even a little bit, that's the opening that evil is looking for. That's what supernatural evil is looking for. Somebody does something to you that's offensive or hurts or damages you, that's the evil of the world. In your emotional distress over it, in your sin, you take it to heart. You forget to answer evil with good. You don't forgive. You build this grudge. That's the evil in you. Now here comes supernatural evil that has put these things together, these two components in place, and begins working on you. That's why you don't let the sun go down on your anger. The supernatural evil that we call Satan is looking for a way in. A weak point. That's how it works. See? Complex. Dangerous. You begin to contemplate getting some payback when somebody does something to you. You consider doing things that, or even awful things, that under any other circumstances you would never do or think. But evil has worked its way in. The supernatural evil uses temptation first. Come on! You're not going to do anything that bad. Plus, they deserve it. They did that to you. That can't be bad. They deserve this payback. You can't go through life being a doormat. Stand up and be strong for yourself. You're obligated to get back at them for what they did. And not even if it is that bad, come on, God will forgive you. Temptation. That's a real world example of it. Now, on the back end of this, the devil drives you even further away from God with the opposite of, of temptation, accusation. So you do what you do to get the payback. Then here's what you get from evil. Look at what you did, you awful sinner. 
God will never forgive you for this. Look how bad you are. There's no way God can love you now. Temptation and accusation. Complex and dangerous. It works the same way with jealousy and envy, greed, ego, malice, all the weak points you have. That is what supernatural evil is looking for, a way to get into you and wreak havoc. Drive you away from God. That's the goal, to drive you away from Christ. An attack in some kind of physical form from a physical monster is far less effective. I mean, monster comes at you, you're going to metaphorically raise your shield, right, and fight back. See, the complexity of evil is more dangerous and far more insidious than a physical form attack could ever be. This is the power of Satan. This is the complexity of evil. This is why it is so much more dangerous than that simplistic view of the devil. Now let's look at the three temptations listed in our scripture this morning. They are bread that will end Jesus' hunger, Jesus becoming the king of the world, and Jesus proving he is the son, God incarnate. Those aren't bad things. How can feeding yourself when you're on the verge of starvation, how can bread be bad? And don't give me that carb stuff and Atkins diet stuff. Bread is awesome. Don't be fooled by that. But how can bread is be bad? Bread is not bad. And what could be wrong with feeding yourself to not starve to death? Jesus came here to be king of the world. That was his purpose. So how could that be bad? Jesus proves that he is the son, that he is God many times, not the least of which is the resurrection. So that can't possibly be bad. So none of these temptations are bad things. Here is where the complexity and insidiousness of evil shows itself again. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to fast for the purpose of standing up to these tests. The Greek word is to put pressure upon someone. To turn a stone into bread and eat it would have been disobedience to God. It would have been a sin. The other two temptations would also be disobedience. Because Jesus becoming king of the world and proving he is the son, in this way, the one that the devil is suggesting is the exact opposite of God's will and plan. Satan is basically showing Jesus that he can be the king and prove who he is without Going to the cross. If Jesus, does, Jesus doesn't go to the cross, all is lost. All is lost. There's no salvation for the children of God. There is no resurrection. There is no eternal life. There is only damnation. I want to point out the last verse from our reading today. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Carefully ponder two things here. When the devil finished every test. This is a direct implication that the devil tried all manner of other temptations beyond these three. Of course he did. I mean, he sees what he hopes is a way in. Jesus is weakened by 40 days of fasting. And there's no way he would just stop at three and admit defeat. So it was 40 days of temptations, not just these three. Also pondered the last bit of that verse. He departed from him until an opportune time. This tells us the devil was not finished. He was defeated for the moment, but he was always going to be there waiting for another chance. Jesus would have face-to-face -face temptation for the rest of his earthly life. It also tells us we'll have to be vigilant all the time on our own. The devil's always looking for that opportune time on you too. Now I want to point out to you a verse from the beginning of the text instead of the end. And it's easy for us to pass by what is a vitally important point. In verse 2 it says that Jesus was famished. The ancient Greek word that is translated from means extreme hunger or hunger to the point of starvation. Now why is this sort of minor detail vitally important? It's not just because it shows us how serious the temptation to turn a stone into bread would be. It does do that, of course, but we... Forget about Jesus' hunger as soon as we move on to the heights of the mountain and the temple and all of that. But the, that hunger has something to do with all the temptations. 
not just the bread, and it has something to do with all of Jesus' ministry on earth, and it has something to do with all of us. We are told as Luke 4 opens that Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit following his baptism. A bit later in this same chapter, after our text from this morning in verse 14, we're told again that Jesus is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that's the kind of thing you can expect, right? No surprise that the incarnate Son, one true God, is with the Holy Spirit and full of the Holy Spirit. We all know that the mystery of the incarnation is that all divine power and presence within Jesus did not vitiate or mitigate his true humanity. Keep that in mind. 100% human Christ was. 100% God too, but also 100% humanity. And being a divine being didn't take anything away from his humanity. The presence of the divine in Jesus did not result in some kind of extreme superhuman mutant. Half God, half man. No, he was fully man, fully God. Jesus was not one of the X-Men or a superhero. He was the genuine human article, 100% real human. That means that this hunger would have made him vulnerable, not just to a temptation to turn stones into bread, but to all the other temptations. Think about this. When you're really hungry, aren't you a little bit on edge? A little ornery, as my grandfather liked to say? A little low on patience? A little low on love? That condition is sometimes called hangry, which is a combination of being hungry and angry. Let me tell you, it doesn't take 40 days for me to get angry. It takes about 40 minutes. Jesus was one of us, a human being, and thus the devil could look for vulnerable moments of opportunity to get at Jesus the same way he does to all of us. Most of us go through life with the thought that there was no way Jesus could have sinned that there was some kind of divine fail-safe device that would have prevented him from sinning. Just remember, we're taught that the two natures of Jesus were influenced, changed, and altered by each other. Divinity was not watered down by humanity. And the humanity was not supercharged by his divinity. The human nature did not make him less divine. The divine nature did not make him less human. This is a necessary conclusion. It's absolutely necessary to come to the conclusion that if it were not possible for Jesus to sin, he would not have been human. And his sacrifice would not have saved us. If he had sinned, well, then everything would have been lost. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to shout Jesus' name all the louder. Make him love him all the more and make me worship him all the more. Yeah, it was possible for him to sin, and he didn't. And that leaves us with one more question. Why is this scripture here? Why are we being shown this scene with Satan tempting Jesus? What are we being shown about the complexity and dangerous nature of evil? Now we get a glimpse into the incomprehensible and infinite complexity, wisdom, and power of God. That's what this is showing us. God does not do evil. He doesn't make terrible things happen. What he does do is work them for good. And he does that right here in front of us. He basically turns Satan into a building inspector. A bureaucrat. Throughout scripture, Jesus is said to be the ultimate temple. The place where God lives. God himself. In order to be that temple, as we have just said, Jesus had to be without sin. Satan putting Jesus through these temptations, and all of this being shown to us in the scripture, to Israelites and pagans and everyone 2,000 years ago and all of us today, is proof of his sinlessness. Everything crumbles and falls apart. All is lost if Jesus had sinned. Here is proof that he did not. Satan, as a building inspector, puts the temple to the test, and the temple, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes out with an A1 rating, certified on paper. His perfection is certified. Praise be to God. That's what we're being shown here. Satan being turned into a bureaucrat, a building inspector. As we're at the beginning of the season of Lent, we are reminded of our own sinfulness and our mortality, 
That was the message of Ash Wednesday. We are mortal and we shall die. We are sinful and must be reconciled to God. This narrative in Luke 4 is not just a story that can result in our admiring Jesus for his willpower. But it's a narrative of hope for us. Hope for us to also be able to resist temptation. If Jesus could get hungry the same as the rest of us, then perhaps he resisted temptation in the same way, like the rest of us. On the account of tapping into the same power that is available to us. This is not just hope for Jesus, but hope for all of us as we are tested and tempted. Jesus fought back with the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Same Holy Spirit, same God. Jesus fought back with the power of prayer, which is available to us. We can talk to God directly because Jesus is that bridge across the uncrossable gap. And he fought back with the power of God's word. Every answer he gave was scriptural. No one knew the scripture like Jesus did. No one ever has. He fought back with God's word, and we have it. Uh, anytime we want it, he shows us what to do. He shows us how to do it. And for the times we can't get the job done, well, Jesus is there. With his love and his grace, he picks us up, dusts us off, gives us his merit and his perfect holiness, and gives us salvation. And he shows us how to do it. And he's our backup if we can't. May the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you all praise and adoration for the gift of salvation through grace in Jesus Christ. We give thanks for his example on how to handle and defeat our own temptation. Guide us through the valley and to the mountaintop above as we live in your steadfast love and your mercy. We ask for these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The very first words of the Bible are about God's own generosity. God gave us, gave us the gifts of a beauteous and wonderful creation. We now come together to thank God and to offer our gifts so that the ministry of this church will continue to grow and be a blessing to the world. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise.
Let us pray. Father, please accept this return of a small portion of the blessings and gifts you have given to us. May it be used to do the work of your kingdom. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 81. Number 81. Lord, who throughout these 40 days, number 8-1. watchful. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous and strong. Let all that you have to do and done be done in love. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>